My name is Scott Jackson. I'd like to share some insight into the devastating leg infection called osteomyelitis of the tibia and subsequent surgery performed without anesthesia that Joseph Smith endured at the tender age of seven. I am an orthopedic surgeon and have practiced in Utah County for the past 33 years. I have treated osteomyelitis and understand the severity of the disease and its potential undesirable consequences, even with today's modern medical and surgical advances. Most of what I will share is written in a document by Dr. Leroy S. Worthlin in 1981, titled Joseph Smith's Boyhood Operation. I asked a neighbor of mine to join me this morning to remind us how a seven-year-old boy looks, thinks, and acts. You wanna tell us your name? Um, my name is Archie Hyde. Archie Hyde. How old are you, Archie? Seven. Okay, Archie's seven years old. I just wanted our audience to s remember what it looks like to be seven years old again. By the way, Archie's dressed in the period and looks a lot like Joseph Smith probably did. So you're the same age that Joseph Smith was when he had a real serious infection and operation. Have you ever been in the hospital as a patient or had surgery before? Ever. Good, keep it that way. So let's just talk for a minute. What are some things that you like to do as a seven-year-old? Like swim and play with my friends. Okay, very good, that sounds fun. So do you swim on a team? No, you just like to swim, good for you. Well, you live in a neighborhood where you have lots of neighbors and a lot of friends your age. That's a little different than Joseph Smith. He lived on a farm and their family traveled a lot by a horse and buggy to get places. And so he didn't have a whole lot of friends his age to play with. So have you ever been kicked in the shin bone in your leg? Many times. <laughs> and how did that feel? Like, not so good. Not so good, yeah. Yeah, I think almost everyone's been kicked in the shin before. Should we demonstrate to our audience what it's like to be <laughs> kicked in the shin? <laughs> I'm actually just kidding, okay? Well, Archie, I want to thank you for coming and joining me today. And uh, it's nice having you as a neighbor and member of our ward. Thank you for coming down. You have a nice day, okay? All right, thank you. The Smith family moved to Lebanon, New Hampshire in 1811 and had lived there two years when an epidemic of typhoid fever struck. There were repeated episodes of typhoid fever in New England and over the years, a medical doctor by the name of Nathan Smith, no relation to Joseph, developed expertise in treating this disease. The Smith family encountered typhoid fever and all the children of the family contracted the disease. Only the parents were spared. Joseph's older sister, Sophronia, was severely affected, but recovered. Joseph Smith, seven years old, was also sick and in addition suffered several later complications requiring four surgical procedures. The first complication was an abscess under the arm, an axillary abscess. The first doctor to see him, Dr. Parker, said it was a sprained shoulder. It turned out to be a large abscess. It was lanced and discharged a full quart of pus. Bacteria from the abscess eventually spread by way of the bloodstream into the tibia of his left leg. The pain in the leg was acute and unrelenting. Joseph said in total despair, Oh, Father, the pain is so severe. How can I bear it? His leg began to swell and continued in the most excruciating pain for three weeks. The first surgeon was contacted and performed the first procedure, which involved an incision to relieve the pain from swelling, but did little to drain or contain the infection that was in the bone. The pain became as violent as ever, and the surgeon again opened the wound by cutting to the bone the second time. Finally, a council of surgeons was called 
to decide if there was any remedy other than amputation. The infection remained unchecked for at least two months. The surgeon who carried out the previous operation, discouraged with the progress of the disease, recommended amputation. At one time, 11 doctors came from Dartmouth Medical College at Hanover, New Hampshire, for the purpose of amputation. Amputation was the procedure for this condition in America and England at the time, and any other operation would have been a departure from accepted practice. In this case, Nathan Smith recommended a surgical treatment for osteomyelitis that had no precedence in practice in their medical literature. Joseph said, as young as I was, I ultimately refused to give my consent to the operation of amputation, but consented to their trying an experiment by removing a large portion of the bone from my leg. The doctor said, my poor boy, we have come again. Yes, said Joseph, I see you have, but you have not come to take off my leg, have you, sir? No, said the surgeon, it is your mother's request that we should make one more effort, and that is what we have come here now to do. The surgeon immediately ordered cords to be brought to bind him fast to the bedstead. Allow me to review the medical background of the day. In 1813, surgery was not a medical specialty. There were no surgeons as we know them today. Physicians operated out of necessity, but none claimed surgery as a specialty. Moreover, only a few who practiced medicine had ever benefited from medical school. These were also the pre-Listerian days of surgery, before appreciation of bacterial infection, before antiseptic dressings, before the surgical rituals of masks, gowns, and gloves, and sterile instruments. Infection of the wound ac accompanied most operations, and therefore the scope of surgery was very limited. There was no surgery in any body cavity. Operations were performed to drain infection, to occasionally repair hernias, and to set fractures. In 1813, surgery was carried out under the most humble circumstances. At that time, there was one medical doctor in New England whose surgical abilities were especially remembered. His name was Nathan Smith of Dartmouth Medical School in New Hampshire. Nathan Smith had gained wide reputation in New England as a successful surgeon based on his achieving good results under difficult and almost hopeless conditions. Also, he carried out operations that few in his day dared, and he was successful with the unusual procedures. Nathan Smith was the sole professor at Dartmouth Medical School, which he founded. The operative removal of bone from the leg was not ordinary practice during the period. Nathan Smith had gained experience treating what was called fever sore, or what we recognize today as osteomyelitis, the bacterial infection of the bone, in particular the bone marrow. It was with the development of surgical techniques for this disease that he was to play a decisive role in Joseph's boyhood illness. Surgical cures for osteomyelitis were unheard of. With an absence of specific treatment, and before antibiotics, this illness took great toll on many youth in both morbidity and mortality. If those affected survived the acute phase, they were left with ulcers and chronic purulent drainage. If there was fever and sickness with the chronic stage, the limb was amputated. Amputation continued to be the treatment during the Civil War and the Crimean War. Doing the operation in the early 1800s was only half of the battle. The wound must heal clearly thereafter. The wound left by such an operation would be considered complex even today. There was an open incision with exposed bone through which there was a window to its central cavity, the bone marrow. The medical literature in caring for the wound is vast. After the First World War, Extremities with exposed bone were placed in plaster casts, which were changed only when the stench or soilage became unbearable. 
Wounds were irrigated several times a day with strong chemical disinfectants. Some wounds were scraped. Finally, there was a period between 1920 and 1930 when maggots were placed into the wound to help with the debridement of dead and purulent material. It was remarkable that Joseph's wounds did not become contaminated and require amputation for control of infection. In summary, Nathan Smith preceded modern workers in his understanding and treatment of osteomyelitis by almost 100 years. Early drainage of infection, complete removal of infected bone, and the simple patient treatment of a complex wound were the ingredients of his success. Now let's go back to the scene with Joseph. When the doctor insisted that he must be confined, Joseph said decidedly, no, doctor, I will not be bound. I can bear the process better unconfined. Will you drink some brandy? No, he said, not one drop. Then said the doctor, will you take some wine? You must take something or you can never endure the severe operation to which you must be subjected. No, answered the boy, I will not touch one particle of liquor. Neither will I be tied down. But I will tell you what I will do. I will have my father sit at my bedside close by me, and then I will do whatever is necessary to be done in order to have the bone taken out. But mother, I want you to leave the room. Lucy Mack's recording of this experience was as follows. So after bringing a number of folded sheets to lay under his leg, I left him. The surgeons began boring into the bone first on one side of the affected part, then on the other, after which they broke it loose with a pair of forceps and pincers. Thus they took away three large pieces of bone. When they broke off the first piece, he screamed so loud with the pain that I could not suppress my desire of going to him. But as soon as I entered the room, he cried out, Oh, mother, go back, go back. I do not want you to come in. I will tough it out if you will go. With the removal of the third fragment, his mother came into the room and was excused again and detained from further interruption of the procedure. After placing him upon a clean bed with fresh clothing, clearing the room from every appearance of blood and any apparatus used in the extraction, I was permitted to enter the room. He now began to recover he soon became strong and healthy. Joseph used crutches for three years following the surgery and was known to walk with a slight limp in later life. The paths of two unusual individuals crossed. Nathan Smith, American medical pioneer in the prime of his surgical career, and Joseph Smith, a seven-year-old boy from a humble family struggling for health, yet to make his mark in the world. In 2005, the bicentennial commemoration of the birth of Joseph Smith, President Gordon B. Hinckley asked the youth of the church to produce some display of appreciation for the prophet Joseph. My son, David, asked if I would explain to him the surgery that Joseph underwent without anesthesia when he was a young boy. That following week, I arrived at Utah Valley Hospital to perform surgery and noticed that my brother Richard also an orthopedic surgeon, had scheduled a debridement of osteomyelitis of the tibia in a 20-year-old male in the neighboring operating room. I called home to ask my wife, Ruth Ann, to bring me a video camera. I then obtained written consent from the patient to record portions of the surgery. I have edited the, the procedure into a short two-and-a-half-minute clip, which I would like to show you now. The surgery is quite graphic, but I remind you that the procedure is done under general anesthesia. If you have a queasy stomach, you may choose to turn your head or turn the other way or close your eyes. If the sounds bother you, you may turn the volume down or mute.
going to be quite impressive. We might ask ourselves, why did Joseph have to go through such a painful ordeal at such a young age? Joseph's extreme trial at the tender age of seven was a foreshadowing of the many trials he was to face throughout his life. It tested him and prepared him to endure difficult things ahead. I have learned to not ask why, but instead give thanks to Heavenly Father that Jesus Christ, Joseph Smith, the courageous pioneers, and many others who have suffered and even given their lives for the cause of righteousness for being so faithful, valiant, and committed, and pray for the strength to do whatever is asked of me. I testify that the Lord's hand was involved in the miracle of saving the boy Joseph's leg and possibly his life. To think that perhaps the only person capable of curing him from this disease lived just miles from his home and that Joseph was able to endure such an operation without any anesthesia is nothing short of a miracle. I bear my witness of the divine calling of Joseph Smith as the prophet of the Restoration and express my gratitude for his many sacrifices, even giving his life as a martyr for the cause. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.